I know you've been uh, really busy, so thank you for uh, making time for us and, you know, excited to hear a little more about your journey into, into VC. And then also specifically um, thinking about VC from a data-driven perspective is yeah. super important because that's like the new gold, right? When you look at, um, you know, investing, you know, one thing that I've been saying a lot is the private markets are converging with the public markets, right? So a lot of the, mm-hmm. the back testing, the, the historical data that we use to train models, I feel yeah. that that's going to translate uh, to the private markets as well. Um, and we're mm-hmm. already seeing that because there's crossover funds, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, so excited to go really deep on that. But before we go deeper, why don't we uh, learn a little more about you and your career? Yeah. Um, you have an interesting background. Uh, it looks like you have a little bit of uh, analytics and technology in your background too. So walk us through uh, what you studied in college, where you grew up and how you evolved into um, the venture space. For sure. First of all, thank you for uh, having me on your uh, channel. Really excited to talk about, like, you know, how we use data and analytics in, you know, corporate venture capital world, which is very, um, it is not many people think of like a group dedicated for data and analytics, right? Um, so um, I have been, um, I've been in, in the country for about, I, I think, close to 12, 13 years. Before that, I was in India where like any typical like Indian um, uh, person, like I did the engineering, uh, I did my undergrad in electrical engineering and then went on to do doing like for a couple of years worked as a programmer analyst for a service oriented company. Um, and then at that point of time, I was, uh, I knew that was not what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be more on the business side or more of more a product uh, manager. Um, so which drove me to essentially pursue MBA. So I came here, um, to New York. I studied uh, in upstate New York and Rochester. Um, and then while I was, it was during the subprime market, right? Like 2009, when like, you know, it was hardly difficult to find a, um, you know, internship, let alone a full-time job. Thankfully, I landed in an internship at Abaya, which is a um, telecom company in the demand generation team. And at that point of time, I was really like, okay, let's just see what it is, you know, if I don't like, you know, if what is the worst that can happen, you know, I might not like this internship, and then I can go back home and like do th- something else. Uh, but thankfully, that internship was, um, was uh, very defining of my career, because that's where I got to play with a lot of data, um, you know, how to uh, predict like, you know, lead scoring for a B2B funnel, B2B sales cycle. And even within a, with a span of like three, four months, I really uh, was interested in analytics and the use of data in um, the use of data and technology in the world, right? Um, and then that led to me uh, taking up my full-time role with a lot of marketing analytics agencies and um, worked across a lot of different uh, industries, hospitality, MGM Grand was one, Starwood, a lot of retail platforms, logistics um, and uh, healthcare. Um, and most recently, I was working with a big advertising agency called Ogilvy & Matter. Um, while I was at Ogilvy is when I came across ZX Ventures. Um, and at that point of time, I've always had wanted to explore the entrepreneurial side, but for some reason, never dabbled with it much. So when I got this um, offer at ZX, my whole thing was like, well, how can I bridge something that I'm passionate about, like, you know, work in the startup, but work with multiple different incubations, but be in the analytics space. So it was like a unique opportunity of hybrid things that I really like to do and I wanted to explore. So I was like, this is like, you know, no brainer. I should like, you know, pursue this and like go forward with that. And it has been very rewarding and um, and uh, challenging and interesting at the same time. Yeah, and I apologize. I didn't formally introduce you, so... I guess I just got too eager to, to kick things off, but um, <laughs> Shambhavi, Shambhavi Siva Makrishnan. Did I get that? Yes, it's okay. Siva Ramakrishnan, but that was like 90%. So, yeah, it's 90%. Yes. Well, try saying my last name three times and uh, you'll <laughs> yeah. probably uh, get a tongue twister. But, you know, Shambhavi, you know, we, we met through a common friend and it's been really great getting to know her. Um, so she works at A&B Bev. Uh, Anheuser Busch's uh, venture fund, but you know, as a corporate VC, there's and we've talked about this too, right? There's there's big differences with working at you know maybe a fifty million dollar traditional venture fund versus yeah. a corporate VC 
Um, a lot of times, you know, from my knowledge, right, the, the, the main difference is that there's strategic initiatives. You're not always looking for returning the fund or looking for outsized returns. Obviously, that's a, that, that is a good goal to have returns plus strategic outcomes. Um, but how, how do you guys think about that at Anheuser? And I, we've had a, quite a bit of uh, corporate VCs come into our, um, our web show. And, you know, they've all said different things, but I'd love to hear a little more about um, you know, kind of a little more about your role and then just the structure of how um, you guys are organized and then, you know, just thinking through uh, the corporate VC's mandates. Yeah. Um, um, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, what um, Z as an organization is focused on from an investment standpoint. And I'll delve into like how we use data and analytics to drive some of these decisions, right? Um, from an investment standpoint, we're always looking for innovation, we're always looking for cutting edge, um, the next big thing in the beverage space. That's that's the, that's a primary focus, right? Where are the white spaces in the market? And that's not restricted to just like United uh, States or North America. We're looking at investments in Latin America, Europe, South Africa, um, Asia, Pacific, um, every single like, you know, a predominant like upcoming markets and countries. Um, and anything ancillary to beverage, um, you must have read a lot about like, you know, the biotech space, um, alternate like, you know, um, uh, alternate like meat, uh, protein space, where there is a lot of like exploration that's going on. And that's where like our theses are pretty much like in that space. Um, how, coming to the point of like, you know, data and analytics, right? So simply put, like, like we are using data for efficiencies and strategic advantage. Um, but I would break it into like, you know, three or different, three, four different areas where we really um, use it day in and day out to make uh, better decisions. I think the first is like, you know, pretty much like sourcing. Um, when you're thinking about like, what's the new thing that's coming in the market, the sells us, for instance, like, which is like, you know, uh, which is everywhere. Um, we always look at like, you know, so, uh, sourcing information. Think about like uh, looking at like hundreds of different like data points. Um, we are creating efficiencies in terms of like, reducing the time that it takes to analyze this information, right? Um, and then evaluating, um, in, in terms of evaluating, we are removing the bias that has gone into making the decision, especially like looking at a potential like investment against its competitor set, or like how does it compare within the category? What has this performance been in the last like one year or four year? And do we see that, you know, this, uh, this would bring value to us? And then... The last one is once you have made the investment, what are the KPIs that we can look at? You know, traditionally in an established business, you're looking at, you're going to look at like profit and cash flow, but in an in a early stage, you're looking at a lot of other metrics, right? For instance, like you know, CLTV, like what's the number of customers that we have, or like how is your online sales been, offline sales been? What does your distribution look like? You know, do, can we, is the distribution make sense? Is the result statistically significant for us to draw any conclusion? What can we learn from this? So these are the three main areas that my team focuses on essentially across all of the different countries. We also use this information to support the portfolio companies with any forecasting or like any like retail distribution, market activations and all of that. Um, so it's a bit of everything, I would say, like, you know, sourcing, evaluating insights. Um, and at the end of the day, we also do a lot of deep dives on the portfolio health as well. <clears throat> and then... What about market data? I guess, does that, do you have your own data, uh, proprietary data feeds or are you pulling from, and you don't have to share like where you pull the data specifically, but is it a combination of creating your own data sets or is it really uh, pulling from different data feeds and kind of stitching together something? I'm glad you asked that because that's the most challenging aspect of it, right? Like when you're an established business, yeah. you can look at some of the partnership data and panel data and you will get everything, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like if you're looking at, for instance, like, I mean, I don't want to name a brand, but then like, sure. you know, you get like, um, you, you get all the information, but you're on the early stage when you're not like present in a lot of key accounts, you're like only focused mm -hmm. on a small percentage of the market, it's hard to get. Um, so from a standpoint of like, you know, driving insights, there is a lot of data that is out there from investment standpoint. We look at that, like, which is what we call the partnership data. Uh, we look at a combination of proprietary data that we um, in Anheuser Bush has, and then a lot of the public data, right, which is like related to social information, related to what you can gather from what is out there in the media through Google search, desktop search. 
But what we do is we have a very robust pipeline. No matter your data is, whether it is from Peru or whether it's from Brazil or whether it's from China, we have a very, very robust pipeline to integrate all of that information. So even if it's a messy data, you're at the end of the day looking at it in a very organized fashion and a systematic fashion that all the KPIs, all the measurements are standardized. So you're looking at very, very similar, like, you know, metrics to compare one business against another business in one country against another country. Um, so that's essentially like how we look at it. Um, but in terms of like some of the um, KPIs and other things, we look at a lot of like, you know, panel data that we get from even surveys sometimes like that we look at like, you know, testing and other things like, you know, to understand product market fit and whatnot. And, you know, going back to the corporate initiatives versus a traditional fund, can you maybe unpack what you've seen as far as just the difference between being a corporate VC versus a traditional fund? And then, you know, how, how do you guys think about that as well as far as like your goals or, or mandates? So our mandate is, I, I think this is, you know, I do not have that much experience with the traditional, you know, VC. So yeah. I think like, you know, take my uh, response with a grain of salt yeah, sure. and I could yeah. be like completely off your as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but knowing what I know about us, um, ZX Venture as a corporate venture capital, our mandate is essentially, like I said, like innovation, you know, anything to do with, um, if it's some aspect is also impact investing that we are thinking about. Um, yeah. But uh, it's mostly like on the innovation side related to beverage and ancillary to beverage, I would say. And what are some things that you're seeing that are becoming innovative trends in the beverage space? Um, are you seeing a lot of like the, the beverages that are like good for your digestion? Um, yes. any, any themes that you're seeing on the beverage space specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of like, you know, um, I think like three broad categories would be health and wellness related, which is where we see a lot of like, you know, zero cal. Um, We have a lot of like, you know, uh, brands and SKUs um, that support that. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether if you want like a, a non-alcoholic uh, beer or uh, a <coughs> beer, that there's a lot of um, products for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the second is um, a lot of uh, I would say um, um, uh, um, related to energy drinks, uh, where we see a lot of uh, um, boom there. And then the last would be a lot of natural ingredient related, like you know, products. Um, as opposed to uh, artificial ingredients like organic and natural. Those are the three top like, you know, uh, subcategories that we are seeing or the segments that we see a lot of uh, traction um, these days. Yeah. And then are you seeing any food tech being involved as far, you know, you talked about lab grown. I've been in the, um, the lab grown meat space. So I'm familiar with using mm-hmm. bioreactors for, you know, for growing food. Um, but what are the technologies that you're seeing that are being adopted to innovate in the beverage space, are they using, you know, like types of algae to improve digestion? Is there any kind of lab grown uh, applications, you know, using a bioreactor? I don't know if you've, if you've uh, so, yeah, been we, involved we in any of those. A, yeah, we have a big, uh, big thing on biotechnology and we're exploring yeah. a lot of that space. Um, we also have a big, like, you know, barley, ever pro, ever wheat protein that is, um, that's a huge, um, uh, huge uh, innovation that we are, expo- we are like, you know, um, building and we are scaling at this point, um, which is essentially um, protein, uh, all the, um, uh, barley converted into protein, I would say. I think like the specifics, the, the people can like, you know, mention it like more uh, clearly on the, the component of it. Um, but that's something that, you know, we, um, it's a big, um, you know, venture that we have, um, that's, um, built out of, uh, St. Louis, uh, um, factory in, uh, in, yeah, in the U S. Yeah. And, you know, I want to go back a little bit to your career because I have a very mm-hmm. similar background that we talked about this. Um, so I have an electrical engineering background and then <laughs> I also worked in product. So I have my own opinions about how that background and skill set helped me but mm-hmm. how do you think that helped you and then you know you know some of the people on this call uh mm-hmm. you know are working in technology they're working in consulting banking they're trying to get into venture so mm-hmm. any advice that or any piece of wisdom that you would share to um kind of help you to help them you know kind of break into venture from maybe a traditional technology or consulting role and and what what worked for you um, that's a great question. I'm actually thinking like, you know, while you're asking what worked for me, 
Um, yeah. I think like um, uh, I, I think uh, um, I think general inquisitiveness to the business, right, to the financials and the investments, um, yeah. and being uh, being um, uh, cu- curious about it. I think that's the first. Um, from a um, from a skill set standpoint, I think there are a lot of transferable skills, especially from consulting or from technology, right? Consulting, especially, um, I would say, because like I'm, I was in marketing analytics consulting. So when you look at that, like you get, like you, um, you tend to look at a lot of businesses and you have this outside the box perspective, right? Like out of box perspective, where you bring in, like you're not like looking at one business in one industry. So I think those are the skills that are very much needed, like being able to think about like multiple businesses and like the PLs and everything, like you know um, how it works. Um, and I think the last, I would say, from a tech standpoint, I think tech is always evolving, right? Like there are like, you know, um, it depends on like what sort of venture capital anyone wants to get in. But then like, you know, especially if you're looking at a, um, a venture capital that's like heavily investing in SaaS based businesses, there are like a lot of skills that, that will go a long way, especially in value creation, be more on the operating side. I think those are the things that I would think about. Like, although like I am not, um, I'm not an investor, I'm more on the operating side. Um, I think that it, that gives me a direct visibility into how like the investment committee makes the decisions, what goes into making the decisions, how can I support it from from an operating standpoint, right? Um, even that is really interesting and eye opening. And I think like people who find it difficult directly as an investor to uh, as an entryway into venture capital or any of the private equities. I think operating side is, I would say, is a good like you know uh, option as well um, yeah. uh, for some of the folks who might be like very very keen on getting into that space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you got to find your entry point, right? So I think the fact that you had some analytics and product background that got you into the ZX ventures, even though it's not the specific investment team role. And yeah. I think based on our conversations, you do work directly with the investment team. You're involved in some of the. Yeah decisions obviously a lot of that gets tracked and there's some data so um yeah. you know it's much closer than not being at the firm and, and yeah. you know being related to that so i think yeah. you know getting those initial experiences trying to find your way in right so if you have a mm-hmm. product or analytics background and there is an analytics role that is out of yeah. fund at least you're out of fund versus ibm right uh, yeah, no disrespect exactly. i don't think anybody here works at ibm um <laughs> but you know ibm is a great place to work my, my brother-in-law works there, but, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a good point. And that, that's what worked for me as well. So when I was in, in uh, engineering, I thought, Hey, you know, I'm, I, I'm good at technology, but I'm also good with people and I like coordinating and working with different personalities. So that's kind of how I broke into product. But then when I wanted to break into venture, I used kind of my product sense. And I said, Hey, you know, uh, when I'm supporting these different founders, one thing that I can do to add value is, is, um, you know, look at the product, give feedback, uh, test the app, download it, you know, yeah. and really give some meaningful value um, mm-hmm. based on what, what I thought the product was doing. Um, and then, you know, from, from ZX Ventures standpoint, when you guys are looking at interesting companies, uh, what are some of the KPIs that you look for, like when you're evaluating them? Um, obviously, it needs to be in the same sector that you guys are interested in, right? So it needs to be um, in the category that is interesting, but are there any specific KPIs that uh, that you've seen as a pattern that says, hey, you know what we've made, we've made these few investments and they all have these traits, you know, maybe they have, you know, 100K in revenue every month or they're growing by X percentage. I guess, are there some things that um, from, from a data and quantitative side has been helpful to kind of have a system in place to be able to yeah. source and screen effectively. Yeah. So I think uh, we also like, you know, it's not just like investments that we make. We also mm-hmm. incubate our own like, you know, ventures, right? Like when yeah. we are preceding and seeding. So mm-hmm. um, from a standpoint of like, if you separate out like, uh, um, you know, investments versus mm-hmm. like things that we start on our own, like which is yeah. where we precede and seed. Um, mm-hmm. it's a, it is in the initial stages, it's all about like, you know, three main categories, which I would call it as like the commercial metrics, like the brand related metrics, how does a brand resonate? What is your, what is the PR looking like? And commercially, like, you know, what is your sales, like distribution, offline, online, um, distribution, um, those sort of metrics, or like, if you're looking at a D2C business, it's about like, you know, the consumer growth, you know, the order rate and th- things like that. Right. Yeah. So if you think about 
the KPIs. It's all about like, you know, your product um, liquid testing, the brand KPIs and commercial KPIs, right? Um, and then we start to look once the business evolves, when it reaches the, when it reaches like from the initial um, uh, testing of the product or the desirability of the product, when it becomes to more of the viability and the feasibility stage, that's when we look at KPIs from a financial standpoint, from an investment standpoint. Um, at the point of time, it's always like, you know, what is your, um, the typical profit and the cash flow besides that we also look at ARR um value we look at like you know sales and marketing spend like you know how does it you know in, how does it how is it looking in conjunction with the net revenue because at the end of the day you don't want to be buying consumers you don't want to spend so much to the point where you're buying consumers so we look at all of these things on a consistent basis so i um on a on a monthly basis there is a data driven memo that goes out to the management committee Looking at it, looking at each business from an objective standpoint, eliminating all the subjectivity surrounding it, right? Like you could create a great product with a great packaging and a great messaging. We eliminate all of that and just paint the story looking at all of the KPIs. And that's what like, you know, all the general partners and the managing directors get it on a monthly basis so that they can look at business to business across countries, across like, you know, um, across different strategic pillars that we have. To see what it means right so that's uh, what i would say um from a kpi standpoint but for a more established growth um, level business we look at like you know uh what is the irr is looking like what is the um, uh, the moeic uh, factor looking like and and also the you know the uh, the cash flow and everything um that's for more like an established business that's in the growth stage but in the early stage, we're always looking at just not just the financial and investments. We're looking at a lot of additional KPIs. But they are like, you know, standardized and um, standardized across regions. Um, and uh, while the KPIs are standardized, the benchmarks are set based upon the country specific, you know. Um, simple example, you're looking at a NPS score in US against an NPS score in Asia. It will be completely different. You know, the benchmarks will be very different because of, the cultural nuances and how people react, you know, on a scale of one to 10, um, how how well, like, you know, um, more consumers in US are leaning towards to given, you know, seven, but this, for the same seven, it would be like a two in like, you know, in certain countries and regions. So the benchmarks are set based upon each region and the, um, the market and then the category within the particular country. But from a KPI standpoint, we tend to remain consistent. Across regions. Yeah, double clicking on that. That's a really interesting insight because I I did an internship at General Mills, you know, when I was uh -huh. in school, and uh, it was really interesting. I was working on a few different products, but some of the products in India and Asia, they it's a completely different uh, ingredient. You know, they probably have yeah. a lot of masala in uh, the Asian. Yes. Uh, they had these corn chips. It's like corn, bugles. I don't know if you know bugles, but it's uh, it's like a chip that's shaped like a like a cone. And uh -huh. um, I, yeah, and I realized that in Asia and in India, the seasoning is different, right? In India, it's a yes. little more spicy. Well, yeah. here we've got like Cool Ranch, right? So it's mm -hmm. like completely mm -hmm. cheddar cheese yeah. and Cool Ranch. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, so I can definitely say like, probably when it comes to food, probably that might taste bland to mm -hmm. some other countries because yeah. they like it. And yeah. I'm, I'm also ethnic, right? So I love, I put hot sauce on everything and, you know, I probably <laughs> would fail some of the, uh, some of the uh, NPS scores, but what, you know, what's the NPS score difference that you think is being triggered over beverages? Because, you know, is it that like maybe a beverage is too sweet for yeah. something? I guess, what are some of those trigger points that you're noticing? And that's really interesting when you think about cross border, because then you still have to make a different skew for Asia and India and maybe the Middle East as well. So, um, when we think about uh, our incubations, it's mm -hmm. the liquid. We do a separate liquid testing, right? Yeah. And, um, to look at it, uh, liquid. Uh, to look at the parity of the liquid against mm -hmm. against like a few other competitors. Yeah. Um, in that, we look at the session sessionability of the liquid. Um, we look at the taste profile. We look at the flavor profile. So most often, it's when we are thinking about like early stage of PC ventures, it's completely a different product altogether. You know, so the, there are like you know um, products like Ho Garden that you have it in US as well as in um, uh, China. 
but yeah. those are more like in the growth stage at this point i would say sure. uh, yeah. but even in that like there are different flavor profiles that are tuned to the a certain um a certain culture certain uh, region you know certain fruity flavors tend to work better in asian culture yeah. um, in comparison to uh, us market i would say that's something that we had found through insights um but from our standpoint of nps it's more about like it's a promoter score to understand whether would you recommend this product to one um, um uh, to your friend or not right that's what yeah. that's what it is um but even when you think about it you think about whether you're comparing your own product against like a competitor's product they will pretty much rate the same because culturally i think what it is is that you know you don't tend to give a higher rating for anything that is good you know um sure. even oh, that's a good point. Like, yeah I think like I I mean it need a thought that came to my mind is that you know even if I would get like you know um a top score my parents would be like good you know it's not good. amazing whereas like you know in the <laughs> different cultures be like amazing yeah yeah exactly you know yeah. so, so that's interesting. I, think I didn't even think about that cuz it the standards might be higher for different cultures exactly yeah exactly so even that's important and and the standard for like for example a premium craft beer is different uh from a standard for a premium craft beer here in the US right mm-hmm. um because you have a lot more like a uh, lot more options so you expect a lot more as well um yeah. in a, a, in a evolving market or a growing market you're not expect you, you you don't have that much pool of like you know options then therefore like your expectations also like varies so it's is a combination of everything but what i'm trying to say is that it's important to have the right benchmarks in place so that you know what you're comparing against in terms of your competition not only that you need to know where you stand up in the competition that's extremely important that i think that's extremely crucial at the end of the day you can have the right kpis in place you can you can come up with like a you know a whole lot of like 100 kpis but at the end of the day if you don't know what the right benchmark is then you would really don't know where you are standing you know so that's uh, um that's important especially in the early stage when you're in the growth stage then you have a lot more measures like market share market penetration that you can look at and like you know sort of have a, a sense of like how you're performing and then most often the pnl is actually a reflection of your business right like you don't need to like dig into more of the granular metrics you will probably need to identify where you can spot issues ahead and fix it from a strategic standpoint but especially in the early stage i think this is um something that i noticed is setting the right benchmark has been extremely crucial and when you guys are incubating i i see it almost like an innovation lab right so yeah what are the teams that you need to put together to be able to build a brand you know who is composed of that team is it like a science like a food scientist or um you know marketing people branding people i guess what what's kind of like your core team usually when you guys are incubating something So we usually have a product owner who do, who mm-hmm. is uh, who is sort of like I think of it as like a founder sort of a role oh, cool. where they are doing all of the work right like mm-hmm. essentially from like you know working with um working with the uh, with the lab to create the liquid um mm-hmm. and then um the packaging creating it and all of that so the product owner pretty much owns the product and they work with the commercial team they work with the supply team they work with uh, then they work with the the sales reps so they uh, the product owner is the core of the product and they yeah. work with the supply team and the different team that we um we seek help from the like ABI where there are synergies um and that's how they go about it um but it's essentially the product owner that is like you know that's playing sort of the the owner of the of, of different initiatives of different ventures that we have <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful and you know and then how I guess you could take it as far as you can take it, right? Because I guess yeah. I understand the you know obviously the very literal numbers of the you know is it getting any revenue is it getting any uh possible early adopters, right? Because I'm sure you do a pilot and yeah. you get some feedback. Um uh, yeah. but when you look at brand and also I think you mentioned PR as another KPI So mm-hmm. how do you measure the brand is that more just qualitative surveys and then with the PR how do you measure that do you do a couple test twitter posts and then see who see who responds to that and sorry so, for my ignorance i probably don't 
no, 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 no. I like the questions. I mean, uh, I wish like, you know, more people ask these kind of questions because <laughs> a lot of people, when they think about brand, they only think about like, you know, the traditional brand agencies and they are expected yeah. to do a survey and then the trial rate, you know. But what we're looking at is pretty much at the early stage is all like awareness to the product, right? Are you aware sure. of the product? That's essentially what we are testing. Mm -hmm. And in for that to test, we look at a lot of, we have a framework in place where we look at different metrics. PR is one of the labor. And in terms of PR, we are essentially looking at, you know, uh, looking at magazines, consumer PR, trade PR. So we have, there are like a lot of platforms that would enable um, enable a lot of brands to track some of this information, right? So you can say that this is a brand that is like launched and then you can pretty much um, set up a tracker and then see what is, uh, how many mentions, PR mentions has happened, how many consumer mentions has happened and how does it translate to the brand's like awareness and how does it, what does it mean for um, the brand's interest? Um, besides that, we are, uh, I mean, you can have a, uh, you can have an article on, on, on a beverage magazine, right? But what does it mean? You know, at the end of the day, you want to know what sort of like awareness that it generated. That's what we're trying to look at. Um, and besides that, we look at a lot of the social engagements, um, engagements on social media, how many followers we have. Um, how many um, uh, um, how many uh, influences like uh, organic influences we have garnered? So we have a framework where we look at a combination of survey, combination of our organic and paid and reach on the social um, on the e-commerce channel. I'm sorry, on the online channel. Sure. And then the PR. And then we also have the survey that covers for the offline channel. So it's yeah. a combination of looking at like you know different things so that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we are eliminating the noise that you would get from, you know, looking at only one channel. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we are essentially measuring in the early stages, like what does that awareness mean for the product? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, and then when you look at the awareness, I guess the, you know, what, what happens if you're not meeting those metrics? I guess you can just uh, put that on pause and then maybe work on another brand project or maybe that product manager pivots. Have, has yeah, that happened yeah. where you've had to kind of re-pivot the strategy? Yeah, yeah. several times. Um, and uh, that's the thing that we look at. We look at it over yeah. uh, our seeds are like running for a period mm -hmm. of time. And then we consistently evaluate, like I said, like every month, where is the focus? And we have this traffic lines that we provide yeah. to say that green, red, yellow, green sure. is like, it's, you know, consistently doing well, you know, uh, traffic lights. Um, but anything that's red, we watch for it to say that, hey, this is not like, you know, there's no traction on any levers. Like, you know, there is not much interaction from a brand perspective. There is no interest or awareness of the brand. Not just that, we're not seeing much like, you know, interaction from a, from a commercial standpoint in terms of the sales data that we have. There is not much repeat purchase. I think we look at it like consistently and if we see a consistent trend, then that's a, that's a, that's a call for us to say this is not working. So we need to pivot. We need to either like, you know, um, think about an alternate strategy, see if it, we can change it. If not, I think at that point of time, we just make a decision to kill it, kill it and like, you know, focus on something better. Um, that, that's, that has happened in the past. Um, and that's that's what you know you you test and learn right like when you're in the pre-seed and the seed stage that's what you're looking at right like so yeah. that's happened for us and yeah. that's where the data comes in like really really helpful because we have had occasions where the brand story is amazing um, you look at the brand image you look at the packaging you look at everything everything looks great on paper right but then when you start to look into the details and that's when you see that it's not working you know so um that i mean as a creative and a brand manager i would have loved this but when you start to look at the numbers they don't add up so sure. um there has been multiple occasions where we have to we had to kill some of the fashion adventures um mm -hmm. but i think that um that only benefits us in the long run to focus on things that are working better sure let's talk about the future so something mm -hmm. that i've seen recently that's interesting is sosv they have a uh, glyph so it's a whiskey that ages much faster. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. use some type of lab grown technology to be able to allow whiskey to age uh, much, fa much faster. So what do you see that's happening uh, from maybe a deep tech perspective in the future for beverages? And do you guys do whiskey or 
just more, you know, soft I drinks wish. and beer. <laughs> I wish we did. We don't. Yeah. Um, focused on a lot of wine, I would say, yeah. RPDs, but not much of whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the most like upcoming space is in the bio brewing side. I think that's mm -hmm. where I, I see a lot of like, you know, focus, not just like from ZX or ABI perspective. I think from the future, when you read about it from an, you know, biotech perspective, mm -hmm. there is a lot of like, you know, um, bio brewing that's um, sure. um, uh, spoken about. Um, and I, again, I think the other thing is that, you know, um, the use of uh, spent grain for uh, creating alternate proteins and like, what can we gain from that, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's something that the whole like no meat, uh, alternate meat, the protein space is something that I think it's, it's definitely uh, mm -hmm. spoken about in the organization widely yeah. as well as like, you know, what you see in the market. So I, I, I mean, if my space, I mean, no, if I would have to... Uh, um, pick on two things those would be the two things that I am interested in I'm curious yeah. and that's probably where I think the organization might uh, mm -hmm. focus as well yeah I think and it'd be I really interesting too I don't know if they've ever piloted like protein in beer but you know I know they had beer that because what kills you with beer is the carbs right so um, yeah. so I, I know that they do have like low carb um, yeah and and I think they have uh, just you know beer that's just a little more lightweight um, mm -hmm. But I think if they had beer that was good for you, you know, obviously yeah. that would be really interesting too, because then there's maybe some nutritional value um, and there yeah. could be some technology to maybe provide that from like a chemical. Yeah, you know. we recently had like um, um, a lot of like, you know, vitamin D sort of, a, you know, good for you. And I think yeah. uh, even if you look at the calorie content for carbs in a lot mm -hmm. of like, you know, SKUs mm -hmm. that we have, they are pretty, yeah. um, pretty amazing. It doesn't compromise on the taste. Um, sure. So, you know, my walls and use a list that you, need, you needed to try, you know, so, yeah. And, you know, where could, where could other people, if they want to maybe apply to CX Ventures, um, you know, if they're preparing, what are maybe some news articles or, or blogs that they should read? to hear about the hottest trends in beverages? Are there any uh, blogs yeah. or websites that you recommend for people to follow? Bagnet is one, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, all of upcoming, like, you know, news about every single thing that's happening mm -hmm. in the beverage space. Um, I mean, traditionally, I would say follow RZX and your page on LinkedIn on everything that is there. Sure. So that's when you can get to know what are cool investments, what is mm -hmm. happening in our space. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think like anybody is interested uh, in ZX, I'm happy to speak to them one-on-one -on -one if there's anything that he, anybody wants to know more about. Um, and um, we have a lot of roles open as well. Um, and you can check them out on LinkedIn, um, which is, um, yeah, I think we're looking at a lot of investment roles at this point. Um, and not just like ZX, I think we can also like, you know, ABI is a good, uh, great place as well. Yeah. That even they do a lot of um, investments within ABI, which is focused on beyond beer. So I would highly encourage like, you know, why you might be interested in ZX. ABI is also an entry point for a lot of people to like, you know, people move between ZX and ABI. So, yeah. um, so that's also an amazing place um, that I would recommend anybody interested in the beverage to look at. No, that's great. Well, got you know, thank you so much. You know, we got about 10 minutes. So uh, guys in the audience, you guys have any questions? All right. Well, they're thinking of questions or if they don't have any questions. Uh, one thing that I always ask uh, the guests before we wrap up is uh, any piece of life advice that you would share with us? You know, you've pivoted a few times and now you're really in the venture space. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, with those life experiences and professional experiences, anything that you want to uh, share with us as just maybe general, general learnings or advice? I think uh, I, what I would say is be ready to be flexible and pivot mm -hmm. and change. You know, you never know yeah. what opportunities um, you would get and where it would take you. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I, like I said, I think like I never anticipated me being in a venture capital. Um, I never even envisioned um, a, a group that's dedicated to data and analytics within a corporate venture capital. So I think uh, initially I could have like, you know, uh, when this opportunity came, I could have completely been oblivious to it, to the fact that, okay, this is not something meaningful. Um, but I think like, you know, being curious and being open to it and being flexible about a lot of things, I think like, you know, really helps. 
Um, I think that is one thing that I think, like, you know, I would say um, that has helped me, you know, both professionally and, like, you know, otherwise uh, being flexible and being open to change and the ability to pivot, right? Um, you might not be tied to a solution. You might be, like, you know, flexible to change. You know, that's something that no matter whether you're an entrepreneur, like, you should, you, you at one point, you would have to pivot, right? So I think that, like, you know, helps in, in, um, in every, uh, I think, like every sphere of life, I think, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Well, guys, if you don't have any questions, um, maybe we they can try to get a hold of you at some point. Is what's the best way to get a hold of you, or to reach out to you for questions? Um, I mean, you have my uh, number. You can always like you know, text <laughs> me, or you can reach reach me on LinkedIn, or I can leave yeah. you my personal email address here, and then. Sure. Um, and then like, you know, text me, I'm happy to um, chat more. Um, we're always looking for like, you know, tech and analytics talent. Anybody is interested, I'm happy to share. Um, we're always looking for, uh, you know, re- uh, talent in, in um, data technology and analytics, yeah. Great, well, thank you. Yeah, well, I posted your LinkedIn, that way the mm-hmm. whole world doesn't uh, get your cell phone number. And mm-hmm. um, I'll try to point people in the right direction, but thank you so much. I know it's, uh, you know, getting late into the evening. So hope you have a great uh, rest of the week and, um, and you really too. great. Yeah, really great. Thankful for the friendship. No, thank you. I mean, I really enjoy it. I think it was very yeah. rarely people ask about data analytics in a CBC. And I'm so glad like somebody, uh, somebody was interested to know about it. And I keep telling everybody, it's not like a support function. It's a must have. It's a, it's a lead team that, you know, drives decisions. So I'm glad Mm-hmm. Uh, we were able to connect and talk about it. So yeah, me too. I mean, I'm a little bit of a data nerd because um, I worked in fintech for some time. Yeah. Um, so when when I think about data feeds and when I think about processing data, you know, all of that just comes back to me. So great to great to yeah. be a like minded person. But uh, hope to catch up soon. And you know, we're both in yes. New York, so we'll organize yes. something at some point. All right. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much.